several years ago, the trust hosted a few talks about ancestry. What became apparent very quickly was the imbalance in resources, in what was recorded, where it was recorded, and to whom it was accessible. A few Guyanese are able to trace their ancestors back to their countries of origin, and even to the villages these people left. Many, including most Afro-Guyanese, are not. Today's talk by Dr. Alston seeks to take a very small step towards redressing that imbalance. It is only a small step because many records remain incomplete and inaccessible, and the task is daunting, but it is not impossible. The first Africans were brought to our shores by Dutch ships about 400 years ago. Many chapters of our history reside in Dutch and British archives, rather than in our own national archives. As I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Alston and with a warm welcome. I'm talking to you from the north of Scotland, from uh, a small village called Cromarty. And of course, there is, there is also a Cromarty in Guyana on, on the coast of Berbice. And my talk, uh, I mean, that, that in a way both explains the origins of my interest in the history of Guyana. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be talking today about what, what I think are the, the resources which are available, but more importantly, the resources I think will soon become available that can help that exploration of Afro-Guyanese histories. The, the, the map that is up there, uh, which is a map from 1844, and which Isabel has already shared with you, um, already has on it um, some places that are that are part of this connection between my part of Scotland and, and Guyana. And I'm going to, in, in my talk, I'm going to talk quite a lot about the, the settlement in Guyana that is called Fowlis, uh, and it's named after somewhere in my part of Scotland that we call Fowls. And so th that'll be a fairly central part of my, my talk. Uh, I want just to first show you where I am in, in Britain. I'm, I'm in the north of Scotland. So up in that box there at the top. And the remarkable thing is that along the eastern coast of that part of Scotland, there are over 30 place names, which some of which you can be found in, in Berbice. Um, not all of them have survived, but there were there were more than 30 plantations which were called after communities in this part of Scotland. And there's a list of the of the, the ones that I've discovered so far. I'm, I'm sure you'll recognize some of them. Some of them, as, a, as I say, have disappeared. Some and in some cases, the, the, the form of the name has changed a, li a little bit. But it's remarkable and I think it's unique. I don't think there is anywhere else in the world where you can find this lifting of place names from one place and their, their recreation or reuse in another in, 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 in an area that is almost exactly the same size. The, 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 the coast of the part of the Highlands where I am is about 70, 75 miles long. And that's about the difference for, for the, the distance from Abbey Creek um, the beginning of Berbice along to the, the ferry crossing on at, at Corriverton. So the place names are a clear indication of the close historical connection, the difficult, from, from my perspective, the difficult historical connection between the Highlands of Scotland and Guyana. And there's me uh, in, in the Highlands um, at the road sign. The road sign is in both in Scots Gaelic and in English, pointing to fowls. And as I say, I'm going to talk about Fowlis in Berbice. Uh, this is a this is map. It's perhaps the first map that shows plantation Fowlis. Um, this map's drawn about 1800, 1801, and that there is the 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 Abbey Creek running down there, the the boundary between Berbice and Demerara, which at this point were separate colonies with separate administrations. 
And this bit there is a plot of land. I'm not sure if you'll be able to read it, but it it's belong, now belongs to, it's just been sold and it belongs to E.S. Fraser and W. Munro. The, the Fraser is Edward Satchel Fraser and the Munro is William Munro. And William Munro, he's a doctor, Dr. William Munro. He comes from Fowls in Scotland and he calls this plantation Fowlis. Now, the sources that are available, um, that there are important resources in Guyana, and I'm really grateful to, to the National Archives of Guyana for their help when I visited, and particularly their, their help in allowing us to access and to photograph some of the 1841 census of British Gu Guyana. Um, I'm not sure if it's complete, there are certainly some pages missing, but I know that for Burbese, most of it is there. Um, so that, that is a, that's a very important resource because it, just if everybody should be on that census uh, at that point. But going backwards, um, the, one of the, the difficulties of this history, the ironies of this history is that because in the era of colonial slavery, people were regarded as property, they were recorded and they were recorded in far more detail than free people were back in Britain. Up until the end of colonial slavery, all slaveholders were required to keep a register of the enslaved. And that was done every three years. And the last of these registers is in 1834. And that's a photograph of the register for Berbice. Um, you, you can follow it back. Um, each of these three year periods, um, which will take you back to 1817. Um, complete list of everybody who is enslaved on the plantations and of the births and the deaths and the, the sales and the purchases. Uh, now, th three of these registers, the first three have been digitized and they are freely available online. I think a lot of people don't realize this. Um, there is a little bit of a history to this. Um, they were digitized by Ancestry, the, the genealogy site, and put onto their website. And then there were protests because um, Ancestry is, is a site you pay for, and the descendants of enslaved people were having to pay to access the records of the enslavement of their ancestors. And so, so um, Ancestry made these records, the ones that they'd done freely available and they, they can be accessed through, through that link. Uh, that was good. The problem that created was with Demerara because at that point Ancestry hadn't digitized any of the Demerara records. So there are no, none are available online. And um, I have my own images of the, 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 the first register and of the 1823 register, which I'm, I'm working through the 1823 register at the moment, but I've got a, um, a at least a complete list of, of all the slaveholders and the plantations for, from the earlier register. Um, so what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about is, is Berbice where the records are more complete, but I think, I hope that work will be underway soon in England where, where these records are, are held to digitize the Demerara records and to digitize all of the Berbice ones. Um, so this is, I, I want to give you an example of what I, what I think can be done at the moment and my hope is that more of this will be possible in the future. So I'm beginning going back to that 1841 census of Berbice and of St. Michael's Parish, which is the west coast of Berbice, along as far as the, the, the Abbey Creek. And right at the end of that census, there is Plantation Fowlis, which in 1841 is 244 people. It's, it's, it's a, um, a, a populous area um, because it had, it, had, uh, it had gone over to sugar production rather than coffee, rather than cotton. Um, so 244 people, and of these, a quarter, almost a quarter, 59 of them are born in Africa. And that's an important reminder that at, at this period, at the end of colonial slavery, Guyana as a whole, and Babis in particular, 
is probably the most African um, place in the Caribbean because so many of the formerly enslaved people um, were, were, were newly arrived there um, because the Berbice plantations only expanded, uh, were only, the, the coastal plantations were only created from about 1800 and, and, and just before. So uh, the, 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 the most African place in the Caribbean. This is what the, the 1841 census looks like. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not easy to read because they were trying to save money and save paper. So they didn't give everybody their own line in the, uh, in the census. They, they, the left-hand column is men, the next column is women, and the columns after that are columns that group people according to age. So under five, five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and then over, over 50. And the, the vertical line is the line for the man in, in the, the, the column to the left. And the horizontal line is the line for the, for, for the woman. And I know, I know that's a bit confusing. Um, and then after that, there's, where people are born, generally either Africa or British Guyana, and their occupation. And, I'm, and the example I'm going to follow through is of this person, Theresa Monroe. Um, and there is the horizontal line that indicates her age. It's in the last column. So she's over 50 in 1841. And she's born in Africa. And if we go back to, uh, I've actually chosen the 1819 register um, of enslaved people on plant, two plantations that would be worked together, Plantation Fowlis and Washington. And this return is made by William Monroe, the same William Monroe I mentioned, uh, who's the proprietor. And there's Teresa. Now, this register is, is a particularly detailed one. Not all the registers for all of the plantations are as detailed as this. And not all of them do what this register does, which is to group people in family groups. So I hope you can see that there's Teresa and above is an enslaved man called Grenville. That's Matt. So they're man and wife. He's 31, she's 35. Um, he's described as yellow, she's described as black, um, and he's a, a boiler, a sugar boiler, um, this, uh, which was a skilled job. Um, he's enslaved, but he's a, he's a skilled labourer. She, she is a, a labourer, a field labourer, and they're both described as coromanti. Below them are their three children. Archie, uh, the oldest, who's 16, Whiskey, who's another boy called, uh, who's 12, and Blanche, a girl. And she, there's no age given. There's a, there's a note for oh, just off this page which says she's, she's a newly born infant. Um, the two boys are, are working. They do light field work. But look, this is interesting. Um, the, the two boys are not born in Berbice, they're born in Demerara, Demereri. And that's because William Monroe, as he was building up this as a sugar plantation, was moving some enslaved people from the plantation which he owned on the other side of the Abbey Creek, Plantation Novar. Um, so Grenville and Teresa have probably have been moved from Plantation Novar with their their two boys, and once they've arrived in Fowlis, their daughter Blanche is born. Going back to the 1841 census, there's Teresa again, but up above it, there's, there's the son, there's Archie. And he's called Archie Grenville in the census because his father's name was Grenville. Um, and he's a um, he's a distiller, again, a skilled, a skilled job and a really important job um, on the sugar plantation involved in the produ production of rum. There's a bit more information about, about them in, in the 1819 register. Um, I know that's difficult to read, so I've, I've 
tightened it up. It's, so Teresa, um, she's not Teresa Munro at this point. She, she gets the name Munro later on. There's a description of her. She, she's described as fat, broad-nosed, full-eyed. And both her and her husband, remember they're Coromantes, they have two short vertical marks on each temple. These are, are is ritual scarification that they'll have received probably when they, they, they came of age in, in their home communities. So they, they bear on their bodies the reminder of their African heritage, not, not just Africa in general, but of, of, of they are Coromantes, but I think, I think their identity will be much more specific than that. Um, and I'm sure this is something they pass on to their children, what, what the meaning of these, these, these ritual scars are. Um, and I think someone who knew much more of the, of the, the history and ethnography of Africa would be able to perhaps identify much more locally um, what their origins were. If we follow through the, the registers, we can, we can pick up something of the history of the family. They have, they have another son, Andrew, who was born in 1820, and then a daughter, Virginia, in 1821. But two years later, Virginia dies of measles. And then another son, uh, Grenville, is born in 1825. Um, so just going back to that page in the 1841 census, we've talked about Teresa and her son Archie. So she's become Teresa Monroe. She's taken the, the surname or been given the surname, I'm, 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 I'm not sure which is the right way to describe it, of the plantation owner, Dr. William Monroe. But her son doesn't. Her son takes his father's name and becomes Archie Grenville. And that seems to me to be a, a common par pattern, at least on this plantation, and I think probably more widely, but I haven't studied enough of the records to be absolutely sure about that. There are certainly, there are a few plantations where everybody or almost everybody seems to end up with the name of the plantation owner, but that's unusual. I just want to pick up somebody else now who's on the same page, just below Archie Grenville, I've underlined in blue, um, somebody who's, who's born in, in Guyana, whose name is Mercury Sam. Um, he's a carpenter. Um, and we can, again, we can find him in the, the earlier registers. So he's born about 1809 in Demerara. So he's, he's, he's somebody else who's been born in Demerara and then moved across the Avery Creek to Fowlis. And he's the son of Sam, who's an Igbo, and Nora, who's a Congo. So it's you know, it's not the case that people from the, who have, who identify themselves as say Coromantes are always um, marrying people of of with the same identity. And uh, so, Sam, Sam and Ibo, Nora, a Congo. Um, Sam is born in Africa about 1788. He's he's a labourer. Nora's born in Africa about 1787, and from 1819 she's a domestic servant on the plantation. Uh, so Mercury, their son, begins work as a house servant at the age of 10, and he later becomes a carpenter, which, which is an important skilled job on the plantation. Uh, and Nora, um, Mercury Sam's mother, died um, on the 24th of December, 1833, of dysentery at the age of 47. So she never regained her freedom. Um, she she dies, um, or sorry, maybe no. She would have sorry. She would she would just have have. Um, she she dies at the end of eighteen thirty three. So she will just have she she will have lived to, um to to, to regain her to, to regain her freedom, but dies not that long afterwards. Um, th there is another route into what's happening on on plant on plantations, uh, because surprising though it may seem, there was a system by which enslaved people could make complaints about treatment again about their treatment by going to uh, an official called the fiscal and this is a complaint against Dr Monroe 
and it's made by five enslaved men. Um, I, um, the Clashy is who start, who's the one who begins the, the complaint. Um, they, they work in the boiling house in the sugar plantation. And he says they begin work at 11 or 12, or 12 o'clock at night and continue until eight or nine o'clock in the evening. So they're almost working for, for, for 24 hours. And he says that he has suffered this for many years, but at present he cannot suffer it any longer. And the rest of the complaints are about poor clothing and about inadequate food. They're not about extreme punishment, but about more about just the day-to-day -day grind of not enough food, not enough clothing, and of overwork. And this must have had a, an appalling effect both on them, but also on, on, their, on their families. And we can pick up some of them, some of these individuals in the 1841 Spencer, so they, they survive. And there's Spencer, one of the complainants. Um, he's 35 in 1890, he's also a Coromante. Um, he's, he's got a young wife, Thisbe, who's age 16, who's, who's born in, in Demerara. And um, there he is in the 1841 census in, in the middle line there. Um, a field worker, um, a brave man, because it took bravery to make a complaint like that, because you knew that there might be retaliation from the plantation owner or the manager or the overseer. Um, I hope that gives you some kind of flavour of what of, of, of something of the histories of individuals that I think it may be possible to recover in future. Um, that's part of what I've been doing in 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 my work and, and in my book, which Isabel kindly mentioned at the beginning. But if you don't know it, it also draws your attention um, Randy Brown's book, um, "Surviving Slavery in the British Caribbean," which is about Berbice, um, and. Randy has done a huge amount through the examination of these complaints to the fiscal to unearth the detail of the day-to-day -day lives of enslaved men, women and children. Um, so thank, thank you very much.